pastor of this young church plan called Revival Church. We're so blessed that you're worshiping with us today. Uh, the air conditioning is already on, so I guess it's getting hot on the outside. But uh, it's going to get hot in here only because the Lord is here. Can I get an amen to that? And for all you newcomers, uh, right after the service, we also want to um, bless your stomachs. We're going to um, uh, bless your, uh, your souls and your spirit uh, by the preaching of God's word. But we also want to bless your stomachs right after the service. Please join us right as I'm pointing to the double doors in the uh, outdoor lounge area, patio area. We have a newcomers VIP table section just for you. Please join us right there. Uh, we want to welcome you. Our welcome team is there to greet you. And I promise you, um, they're going to be so loving. You're going to feel so welcomed. And if you're here for the first time, you're wondering, this is a new church, new facility, and you're just getting acclimated. But I want to let you know the climate here is nothing but the love of Jesus Christ. So join us right afterwards at the newcomer's table. My wife and I will be able to mosey on over there as well. Um, we have a culture of honor here at our church, and I'm not doing this, God is my witness, not for brownie points, but only because, uh, you know, uh, it says honor your father and your mother. So this is the only command with a promise added unto it, so that it may go well with you in the land. Uh, you find that in, in the book of Ephesians, in the New Testament. And today, uh, God is my witness, I'm not doing this as a brownie points, you know, brown nosing, but my mother and father-in-law are here from the East Coast and also my uh, sister-in-law. I'm an only child, so I have all these siblings-in-law because of my marriage through Anne. So my wonderful uh, uh, sister-in-law, Hannah, and his, her handsome debonair husband, uh, Sam, uh, is here as well. So I'd like to ask my mother and father-in-law and, and Sam and Hannah, if you could stand up right now. I just want to honor them. Can you stand up right now, my mother and father-in-law? Uh, if, if you're wondering now, where does my wife Anne get all her beautiful looks and her just wonderful personality, now you know why, right? Through my parents right there. So that was a brown nosing tip right there, but everything else uh, was, uh, was just genuine indeed. Uh, so I want to just, uh, we're going to uh, go with time to the Word, but you know, we also want to make sure that uh, we are all ministers. The Bible says that every Sunday it's not the preachers, not the worship team, it's not the worship leader who are only ministers. All of us are priests of God. If you are a child of God, you have a calling to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the love of Christ. So what I, I want to ask that we do is this. Just for the next 30 seconds, I want you to find seven people because seven is a complete number. I want you to stand up and find seven people, preferably somebody you don't know, a newcomer, somebody you haven't seen in a long time. I want you to all stand up. I want to stand up at this time. And just for 30 seconds of your time and 24 hours today, I want you to go around and give the person next to you, somebody you don't know, a high five or a handshake or a holy hug. Let's go around and greet one another with the love of Jesus here today. Come on, let's go around and break the ice. Uh, let somebody here, this might be their first time feeling love uh, in a long time, and we're doing that by sharing the love of Jesus Christ. So can we do that? Go around, find seven people. Make sure it's not any less than seven people. Greet them in the name of the Lord. Just tell them you're glad to see them. If you don't know them, just share your name and introduce yourselves to one another. But uh, let's make sure that love is filling in this place. Amen and amen and amen. I know that was, uh, I know at first it seems a little awkward, but once you do that, you really feel so uh, welcome and you break the ice indeed. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, I want to ask that you open it to the book of Judges, chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. Book of Judges, chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. And as you are turning to that in your Bibles, whether it be your Bible apps or your Guggenheim Press hard print Bible, or you're going to be looking at it up on the PowerPoint screen, I also want to encourage you, uh, right after the service, if you could be so kind enough to just, if you know the people that were volunteering for VBS, and also especially for uh, Pastor Rachel, um, our, our, our kids, uh, youth, pa uh, our kids pastor, ministry pastor. If you could go around and just uh, thank her, really, I think it would do a world of good to really encourage her. I know she was really pumped up and excited about how well uh, VBS went, and it was all because of God's faithfulness and also the good and faithful service of the people of God. Can I get an amen to that? All right. So if you afterwards go out of your way, don't just assume enough people are going to go and encourage her. Let's flood. Um, uh, just her heart with, th uh, with thanksgiving and encouragement to her because I know that that's something that we, have, we are called to do to bless and, and encourage and strengthen and spur each other on all the more. So with that, Judges chapter 16 verses 1 through 9. If you found it, um, just want to let everyone know, um, uh, you know, when we were starting the service today, I was wondering, 
I guess a lot of people are going to be coming in late, and uh, God bless you, you, you came and all that, but I want to make sure that we set the tone. Um, I want to see how alive and aw uh, woken up you are for the Lord. If some of you who serve VBS for the last few days, you're a little tired, but if you're excited for the Lord, can it get a loud amen, okay? Amen. Or you can do that, can it get a louder amen, all right? Amen. So I want you to just to get out of your shells and be even more vociferous and responsive than ever as we go into God's Word. So uh, Judges chapter 16, 1 through 9, if you agree with something, go out of your shelves even further. Say it even louder, amen, during the preaching of God's word if you get convicted by the Lord to do so. So Judges chapter 16, verses 1 through 9, let me read out loud God's holy word if you silently read along with me. Hear now the reading of God's holy word. One day, everybody say out, one day. Just one ordinary day, Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. Point to someone and say, oh no, that's bad. All right, point to someone and say, oh no, that's bad. Bible doesn't miss words, right? One day, Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. Point to that same person. That's even, that's even worse, all right? Point to someone that's even worse, all right? The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. The Philistines, that is. The people of Gaza, the Philistines of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with the two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Some time later, he fell in love with a woman. Point to someone, that same person, oh no, again. All right, point to the same person, oh no, again. With the Philistine woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Point to that same person. That sounds even evil, all right? So saying, uh, I have to be careful because I know on our Christian reader, somebody actually is a, uh, a DJ that has that name. But okay, all right, all right. But I'll, I'll come next week, uh, ne ne next message, all right? Next message, and I'll share about what the meaning of that name is, all right? But um, the rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength. Everybody say secret, okay? The secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. All that together, all those leaders together, that would equate today to $16.5 million. Point at the same person, that's a lot of dope. All right? Say, point at the same person, if I would do it, I would do it too. All right? Point at the same person, all right? 16.5 million dollars, okay? Whew. Or even someone said even half of that, all right? So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength. And get this, she says this, but he goes along. And how you can be tied up and subdued. Tell me the secret, how he'll beat you up and kill you, all right, but basically. And Samson answered her, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines uh, brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. With the men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of a string was not discovered. Today, I want to just bring to you the idea of the secret of your strength. All of us have a strength. And all of us, therefore, rely upon that strength. And we see here, Samson was the strongest of them all. And here we see how the enemy is trying to find the secret of Samson's strength. Today, I want to challenge you about all of you are gifted, you have strengths, but that's no guarantee that you're going to be victorious. No matter how great your strength is, it's still pliable and viable to fall. And I want to share with you today how this lesson of Samson with Delilah and the following message I'm going to share about the pros and cons of passion, how Samson had his weakness uh, for passion, especially physical passion. We're going to cover that in the next message, but today I want to just kind of um, uh, share with you about the secret of your strength. So everybody take your right hand and finger, stretch it high. If you're a newcomer, you're, uh, just get used to this. We like to get excited and participatory. Uh, you can't fall asleep in our service. We do not allow that in God's house. So everybody take your right hand and finger, stretch it high to the heavens above. Receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I want you to point to three people next to you, behind you, die cross, make eye contact and say, what's the secret of your strength? Point to that person and ask them, uh, what's the secret of your strength? Say it to three people at a time. What's the secret of your strength? 
What's the secret of your strength? The secret of your strength. And today, I want to share with you what one author says about Samson, because he was the strongest man in all of history. And he writes, the more you read the Samson narrative or story, the more you come to realize that this is par for the course for Samson. Samson is a lone ranger. Everybody say a lone ranger. Okay. His story is one lone action after another. Notice the storyline. He sees the Philistine woman in, the, in Timnah alone. Our first opening message, right? He arrives at his wedding alone. He retrieves honey from the lion's carcass alone. He arrives at the, um, uh, at the uh, strikes down 30 men at Ascalon alone. He catches 300 foxes alone. He burns the summer winter crops in the Sorg Valley alone. He attacks an unidentified number of Philistines alone. He flees to the cave in the rock of Etam alone. He hauls the Gaza gate that we read about today to the region of Hebron alone. He's subdued by Delilah and the Philistines alone. And fast forwarding, he grinds grain in prison alone, and he brings down the Dagon temple alone. Everybody say alone. Okay. Everything Samson does, even though he's gifted and strengthened by God, he does alone. He does it alone. He journeys with no one. And the only time you get an instance that he interacted with people were the three women that he should not have gotten together with. And at the beginning, when he interacts with his mother and father, and at the end, when he dies, says that his father's household and his brothers came to take his body. We don't see any interaction really where, other than when the last week when the Israelites came, 3,000, uh, we came to um, sell you over to the Philistines. That's about really the only interaction that the Bible seems to be pointing out here. So he did everything alone. And that's why I'm so glad that you're here. Not just so you could come and fill the seats at a church, but because you have to understand, if you're a Christian, you can't do it alone. Can I get an amen? All right. I don't care how gifted and smart and intelligent that you are. I don't care how anointed you are. Anointing without community is nothing. If you sing and you use your gifts all to yourself, what good of a blessing is that? When you bless others with it and the anointing flows to others, that's when it can be used. And here we see here, Samson was so gifted by God and he is so, so powerful that the Philistines are out to get him. We're trying to figure out what makes it work. But his secret was, of course, his strength. But I want to go a little deeper. What was the secret of his strength? Where did his strength get strength from? Where did his gifts get strength from? But we rely normally on the level. We have strengths, we have gifts. We're going to rely upon that. But we have to understand our strengths and our gifts also have to come from a source of strength as well. And so today I want to share with you what was the real secret of Samson's strength and how does it apply to our lives. So the first thing I want to share with you is the fact that God gives us spiritual gifts. Everybody say spiritual gifts, okay? And he gives it freely. Everybody shout freely, okay? And also he gives these gifts freely, but not only that, he gives us free responsibility. Everybody say free responsibility, okay? He gives us free responsibility of those gifts. Where do I get this? It says here in verses 1 through uh, 3, One day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told Samson is here, so they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, At dawn, we're going to kill him. But Samson lay there until the middle of the night. Then he got up took hold of the doors of the city gate. He used his God-given strength together with the two doorposts and tore them loose, bar and all, and he lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Your English translation doesn't do it justice. Scholars are actually kind of uh, debating about this. Did he just tear these huge heavy iron doorposts and carry it to the top of a hill facing Hebron? Scholars have split half and half. Some say, no, actually the original word means he carried those gates 40 miles to Hebron. That's a lot of distance. Some of you travel about 40 miles just by car and you're tired by the time you come to church today. He carried those gates 40 miles by on foot to the city of Hebron. So we see him using his gifts. You see him as brawn because in our earlier message we realized he was not only smart and he not only had the brawn, he had the brains. 
And he knew their strategy, so he gets up in the middle of the night and he's able to do these things. And this points to the fact that we, here we see Samson so gifted in his physical gifts and strength. Here we see Samson going to a prostitute in Gaza. Here we see Samson messing up, not using what God has called him to do. And here we see Samson using his God-given incredible gifts to bail himself out out of a hole that he should have never gone to to begin with. And here we see the essence and the principle that God gives everyone, including Samson, spiritual gifts. Isn't it amazing? God knew before God created Samson that Samson was going to mess up. He knew, I'm going to bless you to be the strongest man on the face of this earth, Samson. I'm going to give you a smart brain so you can lead your people Israel from Philistine tyranny. But God already knew, because he knows everything in the future, that Samson was going to waste it. And yet, it seems like God's wasting it by giving these gifts and strength to a man that was not going to use it the way that God intended. Why would God do such a thing? It's all about grace. Everybody say grace. Okay? And I want to encourage every one of you here today, as your pastors, I'm your pastor here today on this Sunday, that God gives all of you gifts so freely. You've never earned it. No matter how many times you might have come to church all 52 Sundays in a given year, but that doesn't earn you to get a gift. Gifts are free. Can I get an amen to that? Anytime you actually have to pay or earn it or work for it, it's not a gift. Gifts are free, and God gives spiritual gifts and physical gifts and material gifts to his children out of love freely. So we never actually purchase our own gift. But actually, let me think about it. that. That's actually incorrect because I hear people say, I bought myself a gift. I didn't feel good today, so I just bought myself a gift to make myself feel better. So actually, that, that definition that doesn't actually hold. But I want to let you know, most gifts are actually free from the Lord. And God has given every one of you spiritual gifts. You may not be happy with your spiritual gift. You may be like, why can't I be like Pastor Sam? Being able to play and jump up and down. Why can't I have a voice like Yano? Why did you give me this spiritual gift of service that I'm always asked by the pastor to clean up after the trash after the service is over? Why do I have the gift of just encouragement? I always encourage. Let me encourage you, sister. Let me encourage you, brother. And nobody seems to acknowledge me. Because we focus on the spotlight gifts on the stage. But I want to let you know, God has gifted every child of God. Can I get a loud amen to that? And he gives it to us freely. And with that, God also gives us free responsibility. What are we going to do with that gift? And God gave Samson a gift freely. I give you this gift freely. Now I'm going to give you a freedom of choice, Samson. What are you going to use it for? Are you going to use it for me? Are you going to not use it at all? Or are you going to use it for yourself? Those are the three only options. And God knew that he was going to use it for his own selfish, carnal desires. And yet God still gave it to us. And so God gives all of you whatever he's given you. If you're not happy in your marriage, I want to remind you, God gave that spouse to you as a gift. Can I get an amen? If you're not happy with your children, God gave that child to you. Yes, that teenager child. Yes, that child who's being influenced by the world. God gave that child to you as a gift. Can I get an amen from all the parents? Amen. To you children and youth, God gave those parents to you as a gift. You may feel like they're unfair. They don't always give you what you want. But God gave those parents to you as a gift. I'm not going to say, any, can I get an amen from the youth? Because I know they're not going to say amen to that right there. But God gives all of us as gifts. And we need to treasure to understand that. But it's what you do with it, the freedom responsibility. Now, many of you know this, uh, the fact that uh, uh, I cannot... I, I wish if there's one thing that I'm looking forward to going up to heaven is that in my resurrection body, God's going to give me like, um, you know, uh, uh, what was that movie? Uh, the Matrix. I get a download because I have the mind of Christ. And all of a sudden, whoa, I know how to play guitar. <laughs> and I could just start strumming the guitar and worshiping God, Jesus on his throne, or playing piano. I wish I could you know, play the piano and, and sing. I can't wait till I do that because, like I said, there's no need for preachers because Jesus is the living word of God up in heaven. I can't say, okay, everybody sit down. Let me preach. Oh, Jesus, hold it right here. Uh -huh. You don't you preach. You say you're the living word. But we will be worshiping. And, you know, I realize in hindsight, we always realize in hindsight, God gave me gifts freely. When I was in seventh grade, my parents bought a piano. 
I said, hey, what's this doing here? Why don't we have a piano? And my mom said, it's for you. I said, mom, I don't want to learn the piano. You're going to learn the piano. Being a typical Korean American mom, I learned the piano. I was forced to learn. And so I learned, and I, I actually tried my best, even though I didn't want to. I was looking for a way. And I'm not lying. I'm not, I'm not boasting. I was pretty good in piano, classical music. And the reason why my mom bought me that piano is like, so that one day you could play hymns and praise songs at your church. And I played for about two and a half years, and I was pretty, I got to like charity level number 44. I could like da -da -da do all the scales really well. And then when I got to 10th grade, I said to my mom, Mom, I cannot play piano anymore. I have to play high school sports. So I'm gonna play, uh, I'm gonna do indoor track during the winter, and I'm gonna do baseball during the spring. And my mom said, no, you should st stick with piano. I said, no, mom, I have no time. You want me to get good grades too, right? I said, I can't do piano. And then my mom said, all right, but one day you're going to regret it. <laughs> then when I went to uh, college my freshman year, my mom and her friend, because uh, um, we had a um, uh, uh, they, she had a son. My mom's friend had a son, and both of us went to the same school, uh, uh, college. And our freshman year, they came and they gave both of us, each of us, a Yamaha guitar, $200 each. I said, Mom, why'd you get this? Like, I want you to learn guitar so you can learn how to praise and, and sing songs to God. I said, Mom, I, I don't need this. He said, she got it for me for free. And you know what? I never learned guitar. My friend did, and he actually, he has a terrible voice, but he could sing okay. I, I mean, he could play okay, not sing okay. But... And so I never learned uh, guitar. I, I, and I realized in hindsight, I think I knew it all, but God was trying to show me something, but I wasn't getting it. And then uh, after college, instead of going to uh, med school, uh, God called me and said a different route to go to uh, seminary. And then when I was serving at the African American church, after my first sermon, and, and somebody came to Christ, I'm like, Pastor Hammond and the, uh, my, uh, my African American pastor mentor and the African American church, oh, brother, you have such an anointing. And Pastor Hammond said, wouldn't you lead us worship next Sunday? I said, Pastor, uh, you know, understand? I can't sing. I can't play an instrument. And he said, no, but you have such an anointing. I believe you're going to bless the people as you, as you sing. So I remember that first song I had to go, and I was like, come on, saints, let's all stand up. Let's all praise the Lord. And I was singing. And then before the song ended, Pastor Hammond came up and, and kind of whispered in my ear, brother, why don't you stick with preaching instead? <laughs> I'll be honest with you, for the next two and a half, three years, I never led worship at that church ever again. And then after seminary, I went back to my home church in Washington, D.C. I started out as a singles ministry pastor. All you revolve singles, so I know what it means to be a singles pastor. And get this, the senior pastor, one of my other mentors, made me become the worship pastor. <laughs> when he told me, I said, Past Pastor Jamie, you have to understand, I can't play guitar, I can't play piano, I don't, I don't, and I can't sing in tune. He said, no, you have an anointing. Why don't you leave? And I remember the first time I led, I got so discouraged. I, I mean, I was like smiling, but it was forced. I was like, praise God, praise God. And after the service, I, can, I don't even remember the message that the senior pastor gave. I was so discouraged sitting there like. Then the following Sunday at staff meeting, before it started, I went to his office. I said, Pastor Jamie, you got to remove me from being the worship pastor. Why? I'm doing such a terrible job. And he said, no. Okay, you're doing okay. Keep it up. No, I, I really think you should. No, you should do it. So I did the following week and it was miserable again. I led worship, I think it was close to six months. Six months of hell for me. <laughs> Every Sunday, the devil would be like, oh, that was so bad. So bad. You know that one lady who's like kneeling down on the floor? The devil saying, say, it wasn't because it was anointed. She was like praying for you. I was like, oh, really? Really? Yeah. I was letting the enemy deceive me, and I found out she just, she told me afterwards. Even though I couldn't sing and I had to rely upon the vocalist, I complained an instrument, she said when she was worshiping, she saw a vision of heaven open up during the worship. And she saw angels worshiping, and that's why she knelt down. Honor the glory of the Lord. But during that time, I'm like, Get me off the stage, God. <laughs> Get me off the stage. And my mom, who's going to the same church, the Korean-speaking congregation, came up to me one time. 
you should have listened to your mama. <laughs> I told you to learn the piano and the guitar. <laughs> I said, sure enough, mom, you're right, you're right, you're right. Why do I say this? I got the piano and the guitar as free gifts. And I had a free responsibility to do with it. And I chose not to. Don't waste your gift. Can I get an amen? Samson was gifted by God and said, I give you a choice. What are you going to do with it? Use it for me or not use it at all or use it for your own selfish pleasures? Don't fall for what Samson did. So the point is I want to say, use your gifts for the glory of God. Use your gifts for the glory of God. God gives us spiritual gifts freely. He also gives us free responsibility. But it doesn't stop there. The second thing I want to share with you is that growth in your giftedness and strength doesn't guarantee. Everybody shout, doesn't guarantee. Okay? doesn't guarantee maturity. You may grow in your gifts. You may grow, all right, in your giftedness and even in your strength of those. But let me be clear, that does not automatically mean maturity. Growth, look at me, dear people of God. Growth is not necessarily maturity. You can grow and still never mature. But you can never mature without growing. But let me be very clear. You can be growing in your gifts. You can be growing in your career. You can be growing with more money. You can be growing in a lot of these areas. But that does not guarantee that you're getting mature. You may be growing, but you're not growing up into maturity. I mean, how, how many of you, one pastor used this, how many of you know someone in their 40s and 50s? They are old, but they're not mature. Hello, spouses, do not look at your spouse right now. <laughs> Parents, not look at your children right now. Children, not look at your parents. Pastor, not look at your congregation right now, right? How many of you know someone is like, man, that person's like up there in their 40s, but they sure act so immature. But they have everything else, all the other kukud shaman. So I want to be very clear that just because you're growing in your gifts, growing in your strength, growing in your ability, and even growing in fruit does not guarantee or mean that you're being spiritually mature. Samson had all these years of using, testing out his gifts. Man, I'm so strong. Man, God's given me a strong mind in this. And God wants us to grow. Can I get an amen to that, right? But God doesn't want us to just grow. That's half of it. He wants us to mature. Because how many of you have seen someone that just sprouts up? They're like six foot three all of a sudden. But they have the heart of someone that's like a five-year-old. How many husbands are so good in their careers, able to work the crowd, work with, the, say the nice things to promote themselves up, but they can't lead. They're not mature as a husband in their home. How many people are, are able to just say that they're successful in so many things and God's blessed me with this, but they're not spiritually mature? God wants us to grow, but God also wants us to grow into maturity. That's something I, I feel that Samson is a clear example of. He kept growing in his gifts and his strength and his power. He was reaching his prime, but he wasn't getting mature because he kept on forsaking God's calling and God's sire in his voice saying, use it for this. I, want, I have a greater plan for you to be a leader. Don't be a lone ranger. I've called you to be a leader of the people. And he kept on forsaking them that way. And, I, and as I was preparing this message, the Lord just revealed the picture to me. He said, Stephen, I want you to share this with the congregation. When you see the people in the congregation, you see them, they look great. I mean, they brushed their teeth, obviously, for church this morning. And it looks like most of them took a shower this morning, and they did their hair, makeup, and all that. And, and, and they look great. But God said to me, I want you to tell them this. How do you think God sees them? Not what you see, Stephen. How do you think God sees spiritually? God wants all of us to grow. God wants us all to be well-rounded, healthy Christians. Can't get an amen to that, right? But God said, you know, uh, to me when I was praying about this, that God sees people differently from how I see them. I see all of you and you look a certain way and all that. But God sees it in a di little different way because God wants all of us to grow because God gives us different spiritual gifts, but God's given us all the same spiritual muscles. Just like if you know physiology, that there are 650 muscles in every human body. Everybody say, that's a lot of muscles, okay? All right, point to someone and say, you have a lot of muscles. I know that's an encouragement to some people here today. You have a lot of muscles. 
And actually, it could even go up to 840 muscles, depending upon the definition. So like some organs may be considered muscles, it goes up to 840. Now let me be very clear. If you see someone that's spiritually strong and doing well, it doesn't mean they have more muscles than you. They have the same number of muscles. The only thing is their actual muscles are actually stronger than the same muscles that they have like you have is just stronger for them. And that only happens through exercising that, uh, that muscle through faith and through exercise in that way. And so that's why some of you, God just said, you know, tell some of my people, Stephen, those who tend to be very um, uh, erudite and more thinkers. And, and can I be totally honest with you? I was sharing this with a brother on, on, on Friday. Um, I'm more of a thinker than a feeler. But I thank the Lord for my wife because she always kind of brings me back. You know the sermon outline questions that I give and all that? You know how hard of a struggle it is? Because I like to talk about, let's talk about transubstantiation, propitiation, all these theological things. My wife's like, Steve, they're not going to get it. Oh, this is really good stuff, honey. It's so theological. They're not going to get it. So she's like, ask more practical questions. And I struggle asking practical questions. Like, oh, and then I kind of go back to like, oh, is this okay? So, yeah, much better and all that. And, and so I'm more of a, and, but the Lord just revealed the picture. Like, you know, those who just always want to just emphasize, I just want more knowledge of God, more knowledge of God. Tell them that when I see them at church, they're disproportionate. They have these huge heads on these little toothpick-like bodies. And the Bible says knowledge puffs up pride, right? And then tell them also some of those who kind of disdain intellect and they're more heart. So their chest is huge because their heart is so big. They go more by their feelings. So before their head comes into the situation, their heart's like, their chest is bumping into it. Tell them that some of them have huge chests but tiny little brains, tiny little heads. So small head, huge chest. And tell others that their legs are so skinny. Because they're supposed to be walking in faith. But they're not. So God's saying, this is how I see them. I love all of them. They're all my children. And they're malnourished. They're not healthy. They're not well proportioned. And have you noticed that when your body, one part is weak, it affects the other body? If you get a backache, it's normally because you don't have a strong core in the front. So you work, like, why do I have this problem? It may be because of some other area that's not strong. You think it's just a week back, it may be something else. And God wants us all to be well-rounded. And so God wants us to be growing in wholeness. Can I get an amen to that, right? God wants you to be well-rounded. And some of you who pride in big, big head or big chest or, or big legs or small legs, we need to understand that God wants us to be equal in all these things. Now, I'm not saying that you should just only uh, try to use all everything. God has given us spiritual gifts, but God wants all of us. God's given everyone a brain. If he didn't want you to use that brain, he would not have given you a brain. He would have just given you a heart. And so you got to be willing. We have to know the truth and the truth sets us free. But also it's the love of God that redeems people. Can I get an amen to that? You have to experience both. And that's why I'm so grateful that God called us to plant this church. That we will be a Bible grounded church. That people will be grounded in God's truth in their knowledge of God. But also be touched in their hearts by experiencing the love and the power and the presence of God in a real tangible way. Can I get a loud amen to that? That's why it's not just heady, but it's also heartfelt. And we experience God. And not only that, we challenge people, don't just receive it here. Let it go down to here. But now let it move into your arms and your legs and act and exercise those muscles that God's given you. That's why God has called all of us to grow. And Samson kept saying, I'm doing something right. Look how stronger and growing I am. And he may be in that, but also that doesn't stop there. He also wants us to mature, to be able to get wisdom and be able to see whether we're doing something right or not right. And this is something that I want to challenge all of you. Because out of love, all of you are so gifted by the Lord and you see signs of strength and all that. But I want to challenge you, just because you're growing in that area, I'm going to ask you to ask yourself a real honest question. Are you spiritually mature? If not, let me say this, as one African-American preacher said, and I'm thankful it's not happening here at our church. But this African-American pastor once said this. He had one person come up to him and say, Pastor, I don't get anything out of your messages. 
Can you imagine? And this well-known African-American pastor said, oh, well, thank you. And then he said this, um, you know, if I had a family of all these kids, and all these kids, I feeding, I'm feeding them. And if one of the kids says to me, one of my kids comes up to me, Dad, I don't like your cooking. I'm not enjoying anything, getting anything out of your cooking. Then the father would look at the other nine kids and say, wow, all these other nine are healthy and strong and growing, so it must be you because you're eating the same food as everyone else. And so this pastor kind of put that out there, and so as a result, I want to just put it out for us as a church. We're so encouraging them, but I want to challenge, let's all grow in spiritual maturity. Can I get an amen to that? If you're here, we're going to teach you nothing but God's word. That's why we're asking you to get connected to a small group so you won't be a Lone Ranger Christian. And can I just share my heart with you? Because I need to share what the Lord has planted on my heart and not keep it to myself. When I was younger and I was in a prodigal son stage, somehow, and I'm being honest, even when I was partying and doing the wrong thing and all that, I would still find myself at church on Sunday morning. I may be coming, recovering from a hangover, but I still came to church. I might have been smelling like alcohol, but I still came to church. Why? Because I was in great, you better not miss church. So I'd be like, oh, I come to church. And being in where the church, where the fire is, will actually warm you up. But I see younger generation, and the first line of temptation that the devil gives, oh, your life is not going well. God has not been there for you. People have not been there for you. So don't go to church. And this younger generation, can I speak to the younger generation? Can I get an amen right now? The first thing is, oh, life is so hard. I'm going to stop going to church. It's like the devil telling to a person who needs to go to the hospital. Don't go to the hospital. Okay, I won't go to the hospital. Don't go see a doctor, even though you say, okay, I won't go see a doctor. And people stop going to church for that. But at least my generation, I was talking with this at a board meeting with uh, Brother Eddie and Brother Peter, like, no matter what, I still came to church. And it's because of that that God actually allowed me to start to still mature because I was where God wanted me to be. So I want to challenge all of us. You cannot grow apart from the body of Christ. Can I get an amen? I don't care how much Bible you read and how many books you read by yourself. You cannot grow apart from Jesus' body says you need to remain to the vine and we are connected to the body of Christ. So point to someone and say, you got to stay connected. You got to stay connected. You got to stay connected. Right? And so God gives us all these things and, and I want to really ask that we grow in our spiritual maturity, not just to grow in that way and things that we think are measures of growth, but also to see whether or not we're spiritually maturing. Another way that we could determine whether or not we're growing and maturing is this. God wants you to not only grow in areas, but you also have to be faithful in that. And that's this where so many people get discouraged on. You think just because of this, it should happen right away, but God wants us to be growing by faithfulness. And as you mature, there are some things that God wants to mature in your life. In your finances, God says, do it right. And then in due time, it will start to get proper functioning in that way. It has to mature in that way. But sometimes the, we get so discouraged because nothing's happening. But one of the surest ways that we believe and I think it's so biblical is the way that you are maturing because no, no one is actually allowed to uh, grow and mature right away because one of the signs, as I heard from one pastor, one of the signs of spiritual maturity is reproduction and multiplication. A child has to reach a certain age then be able to multiply. In the same way as Christians, we have to mature and grow to a certain way so that we can multiply. And that's why Jesus said, go and make disciples. We're supposed to be making disciples of one another. And can I share with you, just this uh, Friday, I was meeting with a brother, and I'm not going to uh, mention that brother, but I would just want to thank the brother for that because he was in my discipleship. And um, we're eating. Then he just kind of looked at me, and his eyes were getting red. And he said, you know, Pastor, I just want to thank you. And I'm just, and I said, um, it's, you made it easy to follow you because of your integrity. And he got all, and the dog saying amen to that is okay. All right. All right, spiritually discerning dog there. All right. And he was wiring up, and I was like getting a Fred <laughs> Klemp moment. I'm like, thank you. I really appreciate that. 
And for me, we're a young church, but as you know, one of our core values is discipleship. I will not be content if you just keep coming on Sundays. We want to make sure that you become a radical, on fire, Bible grounded, spirit filled, gifts using, and spiritually maturing body of Christ. And so we're going to do that. And that's why I'm so grateful that now we're doing discipleship and to see these people being raised up. It's about multiplication, that we're able to produce people that are following after the Lord. That's one of the signs of whether you're spiritually maturing. That's why I challenge, we're challenging all the people in ministry department to find someone that you can start to mentor. Encourage them, strengthen them, build them up, because that's a sign of not just growing, but maturing in Christ in that way. Well, the third thing I want to share with you also is the fact that what is dedicated to God comes under God's power, purpose, and grace. Let me say that again. What is dedicated to God comes under God's power, purpose, and grace. Point to someone next to and ask him, are you fully dedicated to God? Point to someone and say, are you fully dedicated to God? Where do I get this? Skipping over now to verse 17, which we didn't read at the beginning. It says this. We can put it up on the screen. So he told Delilah, because Delilah kept on pressing him, tell me the secret. If you love me, tell me your secret. And Samson was like, yeah, the first time, if you get these fresh, oh, um, not dry bowstrings, and you tie me up, and then I'll become weak like any man. And she did that, and he still broke it through. And then she went, you don't love me, Samson. You don't love me. You don't tell me the secret. So he said, okay, if you tie my seven braids of hair, because remember, as a Nazarite, he could never cut his hair. He had it in seven uh, uh, braids. If you tie it up and, and, and put it together over a linen thing, and uh, then I'll become weak. And so she did that, and he'll still be able to come loose. And then he said, oh, if you use new ropes, then brand new ropes, then I'll be tied up. And he kept on fooling her, and she kept getting mad. And finally, because she kept on pestering, he gave in. And when he did this, he said this in verse 17. So he told her everything. No razor has been ever used on my head. He said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would lead me, and I would become as weak as any man. And then verse 19, it says this. So after putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Everybody say he left him. Verse 20, then, he, uh, then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go on as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. When I read that, that was one of the, as a younger believer years ago, that was one of the scariest verses I ever read. Lord, don't ever leave me. I can't do anything without you. And here's Samson. He had, God had been so faithful to him, even despite all his disobediences. And finally here, all of a sudden we see that after his hair is shaved, the Lord leaves and the anointing leaves. So what was the secret to his strength? So he told her everything. He says, no razor has been on my head. So was the secret his hair? Was the secret that he didn't cut his hair? Was that really the ultimate secret? Does that mean... That if it's about all about hair, does that mean it's hopeless for some of you people here today that are follically challenged? Some of you who don't have, oh, it's hopeless for me because Samson's strength came from his hair. Was it all about the hair? Let me encourage you. It's not about the hair. Point to someone that it's not about the hair, all right? Thank God for some of you, right? I read a quite number of books on this, and different scholars had different meanings. And most of them had different ideas, but as I was praying and studying it through and looking at the wording, I realized this. The hair, the physical thing being uncut wasn't what's in this hair. It's what it symbolized. And what symbolized was the fact that whatever is still given over to God and belongs to God is always under God's grace. Whatever you surrender to God, as little or much, whatever you dedicate to God, God says it's mine and therefore it's under my responsibility and my protection. Whatever you don't give to God, God says, you're trying to make yourself be responsible over that. But whatever you surrender and dedicate over to me, I will be responsible for. Are you track with me? Can I get an amen, right? So that's what the lesson here. Whatever is dedicated to God comes under God's power, purpose, and grace. Because if you think about it, Samson should have already been rejected. He broke all the other Nazarite rules. Don't drink any wine or anything from the grapevine. And Samson drank. His first wedding engagement, he drank and had a wedding party. The Bible also says, as a Nazarite, don't touch any dead animal. It will make you unclean. And yet, he touched the carcass of the dead lion to grab the honey. 
And then he also grabbed the jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand Philistines, which would have made him unclean. And then even the bowstrings, which were made from dead animals, so when they put it on him, shouldn't that have made him unclean? So what up, God? He broke all these Nazareth vials, and it was it all about the hair just because he didn't get his hair shaved? No, as I was praying about this, it's because God never gives up on his people. Can I get an amen, right? And the fact that there was one area that Samson still devoted over to the Lord, and God says, because of that, my grace still pours into your life through that area. Because you've surrendered that. You haven't given everything over to your own place. You surrender this part. It's a symbol and sign that you are dedicated over to me. And as I had to share briefly last week about uh, sanctification, a real proper idea of the word of sanctification is not just to be set apart for holy, but as I mentioned last week, sanctification is the state of proper, everybody say proper, okay? Functioning, everybody say functioning. God wants to sanctify you to make you holy because when you do so, it gets to the state of proper functioning. As I mentioned last, this pen actually is sanctified when it fulfills the purpose to which God had created, if it writes. This stand is sanctified when it's being used the way that God intended it. Not just hiding in there, but when it's used on Sundays as a pulpit. Your marriage is sanctified when it's surrendered over to God and is being used at the proper function. Husbands are actually being sanctified when they're actually being the proper function, building and edifying your spouse. Wives are actually functioning the proper state of function, sanctified when they're building up and edifying, respecting their husband. Children are being sanctified when they honor their parents because when you're doing that, you're doing the proper state of functioning. Are you tracking with me? Can I get an amen? So when you do this, that's what sanctification, God wants to bring you to the proper state of functioning. And when you do so, that's when God's saying, you're availing myself to the proper way that things wanted you to be. Those of you who are in financial turmoil, can I just speak from my heart? God's word is so valid and so true. God says, if you tithe, see whether or not I'll throw open the floodgates of it and pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. And my wife and I, you've heard so many testimonies. God does not fail. Can it get a loud amen to that? But like I said, you got to be faithful, not just once, not inconsistently, but be faithful and grow and mature. Let it mature in that way. Because once it's under God's power, once it's under the proper state of function, the way that God intended it, if my finances are given over to God, it's in the proper state of functioning, then everything is going to start to work out. When you put everything entrusted to God, it's going to be dedicated to God's proper state of functioning in that way. And God loved Samson and said, I gifted you and you're going to break my heart by doing so many things that I didn't call you to do. I see how your life is going to be. But because of my grace for you, I'm still going to give you this gift. I'm going to give you so many opportunities. And because Samson didn't cut his hair for the longest time, God's grace kept on. And God wanted to reveal, I'm still faithful to you, even though you're unfaithful to me. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I want to just encourage you. You feel the lie of the enemy. You, you haven't been faithful to the Lord, so God has forgotten you. God has not forgotten you at all. God will always be faithful to his children, and he hasn't given up on you. And Samson is an example of God's grace, recipient of God's grace. He spent almost all his life seeking his carnal, per personal, fleshly desires. And God never gave up. I'm still going to give you anointing. I'm still going to allow you to defeat your enemies. I'm still allowing you to do all this. And finally, he tells Delilah, if you cut off my hair, that's the last remaining symbol that I'm dedicated to God. When I cut off, the spirit anointing left him. But God doesn't stop there, as we'll find out in the day. We know that when his hair grew back, God gave him a second chance. Can I get an amen to that? God's not going to give up on you in that way. And as I close... I want to challenge you because I feel like so many of you really need to just surrender everything over to the Lord and trust in God's wisdom and God's ways. Now, this is a true story by um, uh, Charles Stanley, uh, Pastor Charles Stanley, Dr. Charles Stanley in, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia area. When he was a seminarian, when he was in seminary, he was taking this one, I think, evangelism or missions class. And before the final exam, and I say this because my DT class, you're still waiting for your final, but it's okay, I know. Don't, 